All right. Now, the, uh, the subject that I'm going to be preaching on tonight is that of keeping traditions. And what does the Bible talk about when we refer to traditions? Because quite honestly, when the Bible talks about traditions, it can be either a positive thing or a negative thing. There, is, there are examples of both found in the Bible, and we are going to look at both types of examples tonight. And we started off here in Mark chapter 7, and we already read the whole chapter, but let's look. It's right near the beginning. Let's start reading again verse number 1, where the Bible says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. So you got the Pharisees, you've got these scribes, they're watching Jesus and his disciples. His disciples are eating and they find fault with his disciples eating because basically they didn't wash their hands. They're looking at him and, you know, whatever they've been doing, wherever they've been, you know, they're just kind of watching them and they start to eat and they're saying, well, wait a minute, you know, why aren't your disciples washing their hands? And they're finding a fault with them. So, and this is the type of thing, this is the type of judging ultimately that people don't like. And, you know, oftentimes you may get accused of judging people this way when it's really not in this way. See, they're being hypocrites and they're judging the, uh, the disciples based on a commandment of man. They're casting their judgment on something that's not even in God's law. Does, this, does the Bible say anywhere that you have to wash your hands before you eat your food? No, it doesn't. Now, is that necessarily a bad thing to do? No, there's nothing sinful. There's nothing wrong with washing your hands before you eat your food. And in our society, in our culture, it's actually recommended. And I know I wash my hands before I eat my food. There's nothing wrong with it, but you can't go around and condemn people or judge people for, for this, for not washing their hands. And that's exactly what these Pharisees and what these scribes were doing. And what people don't understand, some people will think that the Pharisees were just like, just really sticklers for the law. When actually they weren't. They focused on the little things and they omitted the weightier, the, the weightier measures, the, the, the big things. They didn't do the most important things that, that the Bible talks about. They weren't even saved, for one. They didn't believe in, in Jesus Christ. They didn't believe in God and, and on his word. And they didn't have faith alone for salvation. They were trusting in the law, but they were the people who, on the outside, they appeared to be you know, these righteous people and these really holy people and they live these great lives. But on the inside, they, were, they really weren't. And in reality, they weren't obeying the laws. They weren't following. They were just putting on a show. That's why they did these long prayers and everything else. And that's why now they're saying, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, you know, Jesus, your disciples, they're not even washing their hands before they eat. What kind of people are these? Why are they not washing their hands? I mean, come on, Jesus. You know, we have this tradition from our elders and they're disobeying it. Why are they disobeying this tradition, Jesus? This is the type of thing that, that nobody needs to hear. Okay, and this is something that you ought not to do. You ought not to be judging people in this manner, the way that the Pharisees did, because of some stupid tradition or commandment of man. This is not talking about judging people in general or judging people righteously according to God's word. This is, this is a, a wrong kind of judging. But let's see, let's continue with the story here. So they find fault with them in verse 2. Verse 3 says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. So they, they wash their hands frequently. That was their tradition. It says in verse 4, and notice how they're able to keep that tradition, right? They're able, they have no problems keeping the tradition of men. But when it comes to actually keeping the commandments of God, then they have a huge problem. They can't do that. They don't want to do that. But yeah, give them some tradition and yeah, they're all over it. They're able to wash their, oh, I've got this down, no problem. And, um, you know, that, and, and that's one of the reasons why they're hypocrites is because they're, they're so good at keeping a commandment of man and so bad at keeping God's laws. And they're willing to judge people over uh, man's commandments and not God's commandments. 
But uh, let's keep reading here. So in verse number four, it says, And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. Many other things, <coughs> things are be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. And this is just full, further illustrates that they, they like to keep the, the outside of the platter clean and you know, that looks really nice and shiny, but their inside is, is not clean at all. And that's just, just indicative of who they were as these Pharisees. They were really big on the outward show. They were really big on the outward appearance. They were big on the outward cleaning. But Jesus explains to them that, you know, that which cometh into the man, that doesn't defile you. It's what comes out of man, meaning what comes out of your heart. And if you think about that, he's saying, you know, whether or not you wash your hands, if you don't wash your hands, whatever that dirt is that's going to be coming into you, he says, that's not going to defile you. That's not going to make you wicked. That's not going to make you, you know, a, a, a wicked sinner in God's eyes. That, that does nothing to you. He says, that's basically going to go into your system and it's going to go back out of your system. Anything that goes in through your mouth is going to go through your belly and it's going to go out in the draft is what he says. He says, that's, that's, that's what happens. So you don't have to worry about the, about the washing of the hands. He says, what you do need to worry about is the things that do defile the person. And that's what comes out of your heart. He says, because out of the heart are the wicked imaginations. In verse number... Um, Uh, 15. Yeah, we'll get down to 21, but in 15 it says, There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. So whatever comes out is what defiles him. And then, yeah, go ahead and jump down to um, verse number 21. It says, For from within... Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, and murders. So you, out of your heart is where these, these lusts come from to commit adultery, to commit fornication, to commit murder. That all comes out of you. That comes out of what's inside of your heart. And that's what defiles you. That's what makes you a sinner. Obviously, all these wicked sins that come out of your heart. And these Pharisees, they didn't focus on that. And they didn't care about that. They just cared about the outward appearance. Does everything look good? And um, because they held this tradition of, uh, of man in higher regard than the, than the commandments of God. And, and Jesus says this. Let's keep reading here because he says it way better than I do. Um, so they asked Jesus in verse 5, then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So like they're demanding an answer from Jesus. Like, why are you letting them do this? Why are they breaking this tradition? They're eating with one washing hands. And I, I love how Jesus is like, that's such a stupid question anyways. He doesn't even have to like give it much of a response except to just turn it back around on the prophet, on the false prophets, on these Pharisees. It says in verse 6, He answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. So right off the bat, he's calling them a hypocrite. And, um, you know, this is how Jesus talked to people sometimes. It wasn't always just, oh, I got to worry about not offending somebody. They asked him a question and was he just like worried about, oh, I better just be careful what I say because I don't want to offend him. No, right off the bat, he says, hey, <laughs> and, and, he, and he goes back to scripture. He goes back to the Bible. He's like, you know what? Well hath of Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. He says, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, you talk about something offensive to say when Jesus says, look, this is about you. With your lips, you're saying how much you love God and how much you honor God, but your heart is far from him. That's exactly what he's saying to these people's faces when they come to him asking about his disciples not eating with clean hands. And um, he wasn't worried about offending them. He was preaching them the truth. And too many people today have this attitude or this idea thinking that, oh, you can't ever say anything to offend anyone. I can't believe you would say that to someone, you know, when you're just telling them what the Bible says. As I mentioned this morning, you know, we're talking about the death penalty with all these various sins that people would commit. 
Look, that's going to offend some people. That type of preaching will offend people, but you know what? That's exactly what the Bible says. And it's these hypocritical Christians today that want to pick and choose certain parts of the Bible that they want to listen to and certain parts that they don't. They want to pick out the parts that they like and throw away the parts that they don't. They're just like the Pharisees. And Jesus rebuked them for their behavior of being hypocrites and saying, yeah, it, with your mouth, you're saying, oh, God, this, God, that, you know, we love the Lord and we do all this stuff and we're so great and we're so righteous, but their heart is far from him. They don't, they don't honestly in their heart care about serving God. Verse number seven, he says, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So the way that they worship the Lord is just by teaching things that man made up. And... Um, instead of teaching the Bible in God's word. Verse number eight, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. So we're preaching about, I'm preaching about traditions today. This is a, a great example of bad traditions. Something where a tradition is not a good thing. It's when you're placing a tradition either above God's word or you're replacing God's word with following this tradition where you're doing something where you're giving more importance to some tradition than you are to, to what the Bible actually says. And he says here that they've laid aside the commandment of God. He's saying, you know, you've ignored what the Bible says just so that you can keep your stupid traditions. And again, now in this situation... There's nothing wrong with, with the washing of hands or of pots or anything like that. That's not a sin. They're not doing anything sinful by doing that. But what they're doing is they're giving that more importance than like God's word. So the, one of the first things we can learn about traditions, if you have a tradition, and maybe you have a tradition of, of washing your hands before you eat, right? There's nothing wrong with that. I don't have a problem with that. But when you start to... To, to give that, you know, like you're, you're going to be criticizing and judgmental over those things as opposed to like God's word and his commandments, then you're going to start to have a problem. And now, and he also points out here how hypocritical they really are because it's not just in this thing about the washing of hands. He points out a much bigger problem that they have with following their traditions in this next statement where he's talking about a different example has nothing to do with washing. Look at verse number nine. It says, and he said unto them, full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. And he explains that here in verse 10. He says, for Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Remember we read that this morning? Whoso, if someone curses their father or mother, they're supposed to die. Hey, Jesus is reiterating that right here and right now and, and rebuking the Pharisees basically for not believing in these, these scriptures from Moses that he's quoting right now. Honor thy father and mother, whoso curses thy father and mother, let him die the death. It says, but ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught, aught just means anything, for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. So he uses this example of, um, of the washing of pots to springboard into a much more serious problem that they have overall in general of just holding traditions in higher regard than God's word. And he gives this example of where they're clearly just disobeying God's commandments and have just received their own commandments and have nullified God's laws by just holding true to what to what's been passed down to them by tradition. And specifically, you know, the Bible says to honor thy father and mother. And I preach a sermon about this. Now, when the Bible says that word honor, Yes, honor means respect, probably most of the time, but it's not just a respect. And you can even see from the context of this chapter and from a few others that when, you, when it talks about honor, it's not just respecting, it's also like taking care of, especially like financially, supporting them, honoring them, you know, paying them in a way, you know, and, and helping them out when they need help. And this is important 
as you get older and as our parents get older, they're going to need support. They're going to need help as physically they're unable, unable and incapable of working. As spouses start to die, as things get harder for them, they're not able to make as much money. You're going to need, it's your job and your responsibility, children, to take care of and to honor your father and your mother and to help to take care of them. And what the Pharisees have done and just said, well, when, you say, when the Pharisees say that it's Corban, and that word Corban, it just means it's a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. So we can see here that when he's talking about honoring, and then they have made that scripture of none effect by saying, oh, whatever we give you, that's just like a gift, whatever you're profited by me. He's saying, well, you should just be thankful that I give you anything instead of it being your obligation, right? It's our obligation to take care of our parents when they get older, to honor our father and mother. But what they changed that to was, hey, if you get anything from me, you just consider yourself lucky and can just consider that a gift. And, they, and what they're saying is when a person has that type of an attitude, that's the tradition that they held, then he's free, he's off the hook. It doesn't matter that God's word is of none effect. Because God wrote in his law that, that you are required to honor your father and mother. Amen. And they didn't do that. But because they held this tradition uh, and this viewpoint of, well, I don't really have to take care of my parents and whatever I do for them, they should just be thankful for that and, and consider that lucky and consider that as a nice gift. No. That's what you are supposed to do. That's what God's word. And what he's saying here is that that tradition has just completely annulled God's word in their minds. And that's something that you shouldn't be doing. You need to, to give the priority to God's word. So this is an example of, of a tradition that you nobody ought to have. And these are the types of traditions that are actually just, just abundant in the Catholic Church today. These are the types of things that, that are going on because they actually... And, and, you know, they won't even necessarily argue with you about that. Now, they'll, they'll say that they're correct and they're right and they should have these traditions. But even, I mean, you go to any Catholic website or, or any source of Catholic doctrine, they'll teach you that the tradition that's passed down through the church holds authority. And I don't know what year it was whenever they hold these big meetings from time to time and, you know, the Catholic religion is, is altered somehow and they say now you know this pope made this decree and now this is part of our belief system that the authority of the traditions of the church are basically on par with the Bible that they hold just as just as much authority so the authority that you can get from going to the Bible going from God's word on how we ought to do things and on, on all of our um, faith and our practice and everything that comes from this word they say well you could go to the Bible but you can also go to the church and it's going to hold the same amount of authority. And in fact, in practice, they give more authority to what the church says. And it's funny because they, they always call it, and I was thinking about this when I was looking it up a little bit. You know, they call it the church, but they don't mean the congregation. They mean the pope or the man in charge. So when the man says something, all of a sudden, this is the church. You know, that's the church saying this and it's the church saying that. When it's not the church saying that, it's one person saying that. Um, but it's, it, it's funny the way they make you think like, oh, there's this imaginary thing called the church and the church just says this and it's the church's traditions instead of just some man coming up with this stuff and all of a sudden now you have to believe it as gospel truth. That that is just as equivalent as the word of God, which basically they're saying that when the Pope says something or decrees something, that is the word of God because it holds the same power and authority. And um, that is the biggest false religion that's out there today and the, the one that, that is most guilty of this type of a practice of holding traditions and, and making the word of God of none effect. For example, the rosary. And praying to the rosaries and praying to Mary. When the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man and that we can go directly to him and that we should pray directly to him and not to pray to any, you know, 
to these other saints, you know, praying to saints, doing the rosary. Um, these are all traditions that have been passed down that originated somewhere along the line, not going, and you know, they'll like to claim, oh, all of our traditions go back to like Peter and the first church and all this other stuff, and they don't. They've been made up along the way, um, confessing their sins to a, to a priest, to a pedophile behind a closed door. Um, they say that that is, you know, that's one of, another one of their traditions. And that's one of the things that you have to do to, to, to go to heaven. It's one of the seven sacraments that you need to participate in, confess your sins. And, um, you know, these are, these are traditions that have been put into place. They consider Mary the mother of God. That's a tradition that's been passed down. They oh the the not eating meat on Fridays, right? You go to you go to restaurants and you could always get the clam chowder on Friday nights in in most restaurants even to this day. And the reason for that is because of the impact that the Catholic Church has had on society in general of them eating only like fish on Fridays because they're not allowed to eat meat and they had these dietary restrictions which again is coming from their own tradition. All of that is not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that we can, you know, it says to call no, you know, no animal unclean. Whatever God has cleansed, that call not, that call not thou unclean or common. And um, the book of Acts clarifies that for us, that any dietary restrictions have been lifted. Also, the, um, you know, the celibacy of the priests, when the Bible teaches that in order to be a, a, a pastor or a deacon that you need to be the husband of one wife and have children. That's clearly laid out in the rules for the church, yet the Catholic Church has this tradition of these, these pastors or priests being put in this position of, well, they can't be married and they can't have children. And that's their rules. And their rules and their tradition is superseding the Word of God. This is the type of tradition that you need to avoid. This is a bad tradition. This is something that we don't want to have. Let's look at um, Colossians chapter 2. Actually, turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll read Colossians 2 for you. We're going to see two more verses of uh, two more passages where traditions are looked upon in a negative light from the Bible. But those are all really good examples of traditions that you don't want to have, we don't want to keep. Colossians 2 verse 6 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So here it's saying, you know, the traditions of men can spoil you. That, can, that could ruin you and, and, um, and cause you to get into false doctrine. He says the philosophy and vain deceit of this world that has been passed down um, just by tradition, generation after generation, things have been, have been passed down, that can basically corrupt you. Um, that's what spoil means. You'd be corrupted or spoiled. And it's through philosophy and vain deceit. So throughout the ages, you could think of you know, philosophers and these, these ideas, these philosophies that have been passed down over time. And especially when a, when a philosophy gets passed down over time, people have a, have a lot more respect unto the, the weight or the validity of these types of statements. I mean, even today, people are talking about like Plato and Socrates and how they're great philosophers, right? And this is being taught and given all kinds of weight and credence and acknowledgement. And these are not saved men. These are men that, that in the world's eyes, sure, they were real intelligent, they were philosophers, but we need to be careful not to be spoiled through the philosophy, through those traditions passed down, and through vain deceit. Just this useless lies and, and things that have been passed down by tradition. And to, to be able to compare everything that we hear and learn against God's Word, against the truth, against the Bible, and see how that lines up so we're not spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit. You're in 1 Peter 1, look at verse number 17. 1 Peter 1, 17 says, And if ye call on the Father 
who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now what I believe this verse is warning against here is against trusting in idols for your salvation just because it was passed down as tradition maybe from your family, from your culture, from your surroundings, from wherever you grew up. Um, he says that you know that you weren't redeemed with corruptible things. He's talking to people who are saved and you know you weren't redeemed through corruptible things like silver and gold. Because that's what the idols were made out of, of people who worshipped false gods back then. They, they created these idols. They were made of silver and gold. And, um, and he says, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So people would pass this stuff down. They'd continue to worship idols because that's just the way it was done. And, you know, it kind of makes sense if you think about today... Uh, there's a lot of people who would consider, oh, well, Christianity, that's the white man's religion. And, you know, Islam, that's the, the Arabian's religion. And, you know, the, the Native Americans, they have their own religion. And it's real, you know, people get really focused on this race and saying, well, you just believe that because you're white and because that's the way you were brought up. That's the only reason why you believe that. And they'll say, you know, just like these Saudi Arabians, the only reason they believe Islam is because that's just the way they were raised, that's the way they were brought up, and that's what they've learned, and that's what they've known, and that's, and, and that's why they believe it. Now, for some people, that might be true. For some people, the, uh, the way that you're brought up and the traditions that you've received, and you know what, this is real common with Catholicism. I've talked to, I don't know how many people... Um, especially Hispanic Catholics and even just others, they're so, in, so embedded and so ingrained in them where they say, you know what, I was born a Catholic and I'm going to die a Catholic. And they say, I was raised Catholic, my parents were Catholic, my grandparents were Catholic, and I'm Catholic and I'm not going to change that. And when you talk to them, because I do, I talk to these people, it's not because they say, well, they know their religion and the Bible says this and the Bible says that and the church teaches this. It's not because they know anything about their religion. It's only because that's how I was brought up. That's just the way we do it. It's just this tradition that's passed down. Why, why do you even, you know, some people, you say, why do you even go to church at all? Why do you go to church on Christmas? Why do you go to church on Easter? I don't know, because that's what we do. You know, they're not going to say, well, to celebrate the birth of Christ or the resurrection of Christ or anything like that. It's just, well, that's just what we've always done. Why do you do it? Because that's just the way we've always done. And that is a really poor reason to do anything, especially when it comes to God and what you believe. I believe on Christ because it makes sense. Because it's the truth. Because when I was seeking for the truth, I looked at different religions. I tried to have as open of a mindset as possible when seeking and trying to figure out what is right because I knew that this could happen. I knew that, hey, I've already been brought up a certain way. I've already been exposed to Christianity my whole life, but I didn't want to let that dictate what I believed about something so important about who God is because this is important. If you, if you honestly just want to know the truth, you have to approach it that way and say, just because I've been taught a certain way or have grown up a certain way, I need to take a step back and understand what is the truth. I purely and completely have chosen Jesus Christ as my Savior. I put my faith on Him and trusted Him because that is the truth. Because when I was seeking, that's what I found is the truth. And it is the truth. And... Um, we ought not to get too wrapped up and there could be dangers to traditions. Especially when people hold traditions in such high regard. As in, especially when it comes down to what you believe about salvation, what you believe about God, what your faith is. Don't rely on your father's tradition or on your mother's tradition or your grandparents' traditions. We need to break that mentality of trusting a belief just because it's passed down through your family. And, you know, sometimes that could be difficult, especially when you have a family that loves you. 
You have people that care for you. And, and again, I mean, I mean, I deal with this quite a bit. And I'll talk to people and say, well, I know that my parents, they wouldn't steer me wrong. Because they love them, because they have a good, strong family, because, you know, they look out for each other and, you know, praise God that they've got a, they've got a good, strong family. But what, they, what you've got to understand, what people have to understand is that if it's just a tradition, you can't trust, you know, they be, might be the most well-intentioned people in your life. They may be trying their best to teach you the truth, but if they're deceived also, and you're deceived, why would you just put blind faith in, in that tradition just because it came from your parents? You should hold the truth in more regard than, than the source of my parents or this tradition or whatever, wherever you're receiving your information from. Everybody is responsible for determining for themselves what is truth and, and what is, you know, what's right and what's wrong. It's our own responsibility, and, and it's a cop-out of someone who doesn't want to do the work, who doesn't want to think, who wants to have other people think for them to just rely on the tradition, rely on what has been passed down to me, instead of wanting to know for yourself. And it's sad when people have that type of a mindset, because if you try to convince them and say, you know, I'm sure your parents loved you and they were trying to tell you everything that was right. And this is what they honestly believed. I'm sure they believe it. But they were deceived. They were deceived by somebody else who told them that that's the truth. And it's not the truth. And I'm here trying to show you the truth. And it's right in black and white right here. And you can see it for yourself. Why don't you look at the evidence, look at the information and decide for yourself. Don't rely on something that someone told you once because it's tradition. And that's just the way it's been done in your family for a hundred years. That doesn't mean anything. This is what, where the importance lies. It's in God's word. Turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we're going to start looking at some positive references to traditions. We covered a lot of negative traditions. And this is, this is what people commonly refer to even when they're talking about traditions in the Bible and stuff are these type of negative traditions. But, um, and some people don't even think realize that traditions can be positive and there's, there's not necessarily anything wrong with them because there's, there tends to be oftentimes a focus on the negative traditions. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Verse number 15 of 2 Thessalonians 2 reads, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Um, traditions are something that may or may not be found in Scripture, just in general, when you're talking about a tradition. Think about any tradition. I mean, a tradition of, we're talking about today, tradition of a birthday. Right? That's a tradition. We hold birthdays. We have a birthday party every year on your birthday or not mine, but like on the kids' birthdays. We'll throw a party for them. We'll invite people over. We'll celebrate. That's a tradition. And that's common. That's definitely a common tradition in America. I grew up with that my whole life. Now, is celebrating birthdays like that found in the Bible? No. Does that make it right? Does that make it wrong? Doesn't make it anything. It's just a tradition. Right? Um, so certain traditions, they may or may not have to do with the Bible. They may come from the Bible. They may not. Um, it, another example, in the Old Testament, there were feasts that they celebrated every year. Right? The Feast of Unle Unleavened Bread and all these just, just various feasts that were ordained in the Old Testament. Those were traditions also. That's something that they did year after year after year. They were traditions. But they were also commanded in the Bible. That was something that they were supposed to do. That's what something that God ordained. So God ordained for them to keep a tradition. Those would be an example of a good tradition. Um, and another example of a good tradition that you could find in the New Testament is attending church. Right? What do you do on Sunday? I go to church. Every Sunday I go to church. I go to church every week. That's our tradition. We do that. And it's a good tradition because the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Right? Another thing you could find in the Bible that could be considered a tradition. It's a good tradition. Um, we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, like I just said. Now, um, 
turn if you would to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, just one page over, uh, chapter 3. Because here we're being exhorted, brethren, stand fast behold, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So the, the, the traditions coming from the epistles, right, or their words when we're speaking the word of God. We have them in the epistles today, these traditions that we should hold to. Look at chapter 3, verse 6, 2 Thessalonians. He says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed." Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So here we're seeing this tradition by an epistle for them to work hard. Saying that, look, if you're not going to work, then you're not going to eat. And he said, we were giving ourselves as examples for you to follow. This is the tradition that we're starting. This is the tradition that we're setting forth is that we're going to work day and night, laboring and traveling and doing the work of an evangelist and doing work with our own hands to show you that, hey, as a Christian, you need to work hard. And this is a tradition that needs to be set forward because if it's not, people are going to get lazy. And you don't want a bunch of lazy Christians who don't want to go out and preach the word of God, who, who just want to want to you know, go to the government for support instead of just working with their own hands and providing for their own families and being worse than an infidel by not doing that work. This is a good tradition that we need to keep from the Bible. Hard work, working day and night and laboring as Jesus Christ himself did, as the apostles did. All of the work that they set forth is important. This is a tradition that we ought to keep. Now, I already mentioned like keeping birthdays and stuff, but one tradition is I'm going to kind of close on this last point because at this time of the year, people get hung up on celebrating Christmas. Now, is celebrating Christmas a tradition? Absolutely. Is it something commanded in the Bible to do? Nope. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have to Celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ's birth. Celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say that you have to, you know, celebrate Christmas or anything about December 25th or anything like that. It never says you have to do it. Now, is there anything sinful about keeping that tradition? Are we making any commandments of God of none effect by celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ on December 25th? I would say no. Show me in the Bible where I am sinning by, by recognizing, celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, by giving gifts unto my children and giving gifts unto my family members and other people that I love and celebrating and being joyful and glad for the fact that our Savior was born. And, um, you know, I don't see that there's a problem with that in Scripture either. Now, I will say this. I do believe that there are some aspects of the way that people celebrate Christmas that can go against Scripture. That can be something that, that, that we ought not to do because it's going to contradict the Bible and conflict with the Bible and that we should avoid that and stay away from that and not do those things. A, a perfect example of that would be um, this idea of Santa Claus. I don't believe that, that I, believe, I believe that it's actually wicked to, to incorporate Santa Claus into your Christmas tradition. 
for multiple reasons, and I'll just briefly mention a few of them. One, you're lying to your children when you say Santa Claus is going to come and bring presents for you and leave them in the house. That's a lie because Santa Claus is not real. Spoiler alert, he doesn't exist, right? It's fake. It's made up. Now, I'm all for playing games with my children and using imagination and things like that, but we always know that that's what we're doing when we do that, when we make up stories, when we do things. It's, it's you know, an act of imagination. I'm not ever lying to my children and just saying, hey, there's this person who's going to come into our house at night, which already is kind of creepy in and of itself. And if anyone has ever found in my house at night, the last thing I want them thinking is that, oh, this person's friendly. If anyone ever were to come into my house, that's the last thing they should be thinking. But, I mean, I, that's not even why it's wicked. But the first point is just that it's lying to your children. The other thing is that the Santa Claus that's, that is invented has attributes of God. That he knows what you've been doing. He knows if you've been naughty. He knows if you've been nice. Basically, he watches you throughout the whole year. And, and is keeping tabs and keeping track on all of your sins. That's wicked. Okay, no one else does that. God knows what you've been doing. God knows your thoughts. God knows these things. Not Santa Claus. Okay, don't invent this entity or this being that has these God-like attributes that is able to essentially practically be everywhere at once by being able to hit every single home in the whole world in one night. It's wicked. And, and lastly, and, and I think most importantly of all, from the time of a young child, it perverts their understanding of a free gift. It's perverted. A free gift, the free gift of salvation is one of the best illustrations that you can possibly use when soul winning for people to understand, hey man, salvation is bought, it's paid for, it's a free gift. You just have to accept it. It's given to you for free. Santa Claus teaches that you better be good throughout the year in order to receive a gift. That's earning it, my friend. That is not a free gift. That's saying, I have to do what's right. I have to do what's good. And if I'm good enough, maybe I'll receive something for Christmas this year. That's not a gift. And it's perverting that idea. And you say, no, no, they know. They know what a gift is. No. When this is shoved down their throat, it's in the music, it's, it's, it's repeated, lies repeated year after year after year until they finally figured out that my parents lied to me about Santa Claus. And then they start to wonder, I wonder if they're lying to me about God too because I can't see him. Am I just going to get a little bit older and then they'll, they'll tell me later on, oh yeah, hey, by the way, that God person we told you about, that was fake too, just like Santa Claus was. These are important things. That's why we don't ever incorporate that into our celebration of Christmas. So there are some things where I believe that they should not be a part of your celebration whatsoever. And the reason being is because that tradition is going to make the commandments of God of none effect. Like lying to, to anybody, bearing false witness that this person is true and real. That is making the, the commandment of God of none effect. Um, another one, another, which this is probably a little bit outdated these days, but uh, mistletoe. You know, people hang up this plant that people will kiss underneath. And, you know, from my understanding, people will just, you know, man and a woman underneath the mistletoe, oh, hey, look, there's mistletoe, and you kiss. And they don't have to be married. It could be whatever, whatever situation it is. That's wickedness. You know, you, you, you shouldn't be participating in something like that either. You ought not to be kissing anyone but your spouse um, or your grandmother. <laughs> Obviously, it's a different type of kissing. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's another tradition that, that we, don't, we, don't keep, uh, we don't keep here. So those are a couple things. Now, other traditions I don't have a problem with. For example... Hanging up LED lights around the house that are different colors. Can anybody show me from the Bible why on earth that would ever be a sin? And if it's during 
The month of December, that's just wicked. You can't do that. Like, they didn't even have LED lights or these colored lights or anything of this sort <laughs> until very recently. What's the harm? In it? I, I don't see how that contradicts anything. But one of the biggest things that people complain about because they'll say, oh, Christmas is this, you know, celebrating Christmas, is a, it's a pagan religion. You're following after the heathen. You're worshiping God after the way they worship their gods and all this other stuff. It's nonsense. I've looked into it for myself. I've done my own research. And half the time you're getting misinformation, people just repeating lies that aren't even true. But second of all, and what I'm going to close with is just this concept of the Christmas tree and then I'm going to get into the actual day because people have a problem with both. People say that the day is pagan and they'll say that the tree is pagan. Now, first of all, if I want to bring a tree into my house as a decoration, how is that sinful? Again, I, I don't see any commandments against decorating your house with a tree. Even regardless of the reason, bring, you know, chopping down a tree, bring it in your house. In fact, I see you know, how many people have flowers and plants and other things all about their house in general, even when it's not Christmas. It's not an odd thing to have that as a decoration in your house. And they'll say, oh, no, well, it's not that it's a decoration. It's because you're worshiping God. I'm not worshiping the tree, and I'm not worshiping Jesus by having a tree in my house. The tree smells nice, and it's lit up, and it's fun, and it's just a tradition. But it's not, I don't believe that there's any commandments of God that are being, that are being disannulled or making the, the commandments of God of none effect by, by following a tradition like that. Just like following the tradition of having a birthday, it, you're, not, you're not disobeying any of God's commands by doing that. I don't see any problem with the Christmas tree. And actually, people say, oh, well, these pagans did this. Now, and, and I always ask this because everything is, according to some people, everything is pagan. I mean, everything in the world is pagan, essentially. So what can you possibly do? And I always ask, well, what came first? Because they like to say, oh, Christianity is just this, this new religion. It's, no, it's not. No, it's not. The name Christianity, maybe, because that, that would have to come with Jesus Christ. But the religion itself, the religion has been around since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Amen. Okay? That's where it started. It started with the first two human beings to walk the face of this earth and their relationship with God and God giving them knowledge and God giving them truth. That religion has been around forever. So what you have to ask yourself, because they'll say, oh, well, these ancient Egyptians or these ancient Celtic religions, they're older than the, you know, the religion of the Bible. No, they're not. This has been around forever. It doesn't matter what name it's been called. This religion has been around forever of faith in the Lord, in Jehovah, in God, in Jesus Christ. That's why we have an Old Testament and New Testament and preach and teach out of both, and they're both the Word of God. Because in the Old Testament, it might have been known as Judaism or, you know, with the, with the children of Israel. And in the New Testament, it's known as Christianity. But either way, it's the same true one religion that has always existed. So I'll ask people, say, well, how do you know that that started with the pagans and that they weren't just copying something that was already part of the true religion? How do you know that? Because you're reading some book about something that... That, that you think might have happened in the 1200s or in 800 or in 600 or whatever, whatever time frame it was, and you're just saying that, that that is just ultimate truth? What if I were to show you a verse from the Bible that talks about God decorating His house with a tree? How do you know that that's not the origin of celebrating these things and that it has to come from some pagan just because some pagan does something? How do you know that the pagans didn't rip off this idea and this concept from Christianity or from the true religion from the Bible. How do you know that? What we're doing today has nothing to do with paganism. Look in your Bibles in Isaiah chapter 60. Because think about when you go out and shop for a Christmas tree, what are the common type of trees that are out there? There's fir tree, right? Like the one that we have is a fir tree. Or, um, well, a pine tree. 
right? Are those like the common trees that, that you would find if you're typically looking for a tree to bring in your house to decorate for Christmas? Look at Isaiah 60. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says, The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. Isaiah 60, we're seeing the place of God's sanctuary being beautified by having fir trees and pine trees in the place of the sanctuary. So who is mimicking who? When we can see a verse like this found in the Bible that talks about a tree beautifying a place. Is that just inherently wicked and sinful? Oh, that's pagan, God. You can't have that in your sanctuary because the pagans brought Christmas brought trees in and used that to beautify. It's stupidity. Okay, We can't get caught up in this Hebrew roots movement type people that, that want to just, just say everything's pagan. I mean, we shouldn't even use the days of the week that we have then because Sunday is... You know, about worshiping the sun, and Monday is about the moon, and, you know, Thursday is about Thor, and you could say all these other things. Look, it's all pagan. Does that mean we just, I mean, we just can't even say the days of the week anymore? Because now you're going to be participating in wickedness. That's the type of logic that they use. And um, the last thing, turn to Romans 14. This is, or we'll close with this, and then we're done. Romans 14. Because people will say, well, I got a problem with celebrating Christmas on December 25th because that day is wicked, that day is pagan, and all this other stuff. Look, if we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, first of all, it has to be done on a day. We all agree that. It, someone's got to pick a day. There's got to be a time where it's picked to say, we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ on this day. Does anybody know the exact day that Christ was born? No. I don't think you cannot prove that 100% without a shadow of a doubt from the Bible. Maybe you can prove around some type of a time frame. Maybe. But you can't say he was born on this specific day. You can't do that. That's not found in Scripture. So we need to pick a day. And there's you know, just as much chance it was December 25th as just about any other day of the year. So um, I've got no problems with that. But look at Romans 14. Look at verse number 1. It says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. He's basically saying, look, if someone wants to hold a day in high regard, fine. If someone doesn't want to hold a day in high regard, Fine. Don't condemn the person that holds a day in regard and don't condemn the person that doesn't hold a day in regard. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. You know, you don't need to be criticizing and judging me because I celebrate Christmas on December 25th because that's the day I decide to elevate and choose to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to go and criticize someone else for not following that day or celebrating on December 25th. Look, I don't care. If you want to celebrate Christmas, fine. If you don't want to celebrate Christmas, fine. It doesn't matter. And that's what we see in Romans chapter 14 here is that, look, do what you want to do. This is something that, that this is not a commandment of God. And to say anything otherwise, whether you're criticizing someone for celebrating or not celebrating, that's a commandment of man. And that's going to be holding that tradition in higher regard than the Bible when you start criticizing people for that. And, um, you know, I have no problem celebrating Christmas unless there's, a, you know, there's, there are a few things we shouldn't be caught up. And, you know, with the whole commercialism and all that other garbage and, you know, making it about something that it's not, obviously those things are wrong. But the holiday itself, 
decorating itself, you know, decorations themselves in general. I mean, if you're if you're putting up carved statues and you know idols of of you know Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus, you know, I got a problem with that. I think again, you say, oh, but we've had this tradition and this has been passed down from my grandparents. This nativity scene, it's got the baby Jesus, it's got all these other people here, these figurines, and I say, no, it's idolatry. Don't let your traditions supersede the Bible and the, and the commandments of God. But at the same time, you're celebrating the holiday, you've got no problem with that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible, for your words. I pray that you would please just um, help us to have the discernment to know the difference between you know, right from wrong and understanding what traditions are okay and acceptable and what traditions are not okay, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just... Um, Continue to teach us, Lord. We, we have a desire just to learn from you and to learn from the Bible. And um, Lord, we love you. I pray that we be honoring unto you and to your name with the traditions that we do keep. Help us to keep the good traditions of being hard workers and um, just doing things that are going to bring honor and glory unto your name, dear Lord. And that we would be able to pass these traditions of standing on your word and working hard down to our children that they can keep those same righteous, godly traditions, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.